Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Greco, and I will be working behind the scenes here for the SDEC during this session. Uh, for those of you who are new to the SDEC, we are a free digital marketing slash digital analytics education community, and we provide weekly sessions on topics that we think might be of interest to our community. We've got about 4,000 people in the community right now, and all sessions are recorded and posted to our Slack group. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker, Dennis, uh, uh, during the session, you can use the Zoom Q&A area, and we will tackle some of those questions afterwards. Um, and if you have any technical issues or questions about the SDEC, then you can go ahead and use the chat feature, and I will be monitoring that and making sure that uh, everything is good during this session. So this session is in our data science area. And I am a little bit new to the topic that Dennis is going to be covering. I've heard a little bit about what his company does and what he does. So I'm just like you, anticipating what we're going to learn here. So I will turn it over to Dennis. And Dennis, I'll just ask if you can uh, try to uh, you know, leave it like 10 minutes or so at the end in case we have some people who want to ask questions. But I'll take it away. Sure. Thanks much. Learn is obviously a very strong word uh, when you speak to a set of experts. So if anything, what I hope to do here today is inject a set of items for where if you go about doing something similar in a different vertical, or even if you do uh, exactly what I do in my vertical, that you don't do some of the, or don't apply some of the same mistakes uh, that we certainly did uh, early on. So what I've done today is that I've extracted five particular uh, learnings over the last uh, good half decade for where we worked on this kind of particular challenge of trying to build an intelligent agent that can help you schedule your meetings. So just a footnote on that, we are one of those SaaS tools for where it's very easy to describe to people what we do, but it's very uh, difficult to kind of co-execute on it. It's almost like me describing to my mom what a self-driving car is. That is very easy to imagine. You don't necessarily need to be super tech savvy to understand that I walk out, jump into the car, give it an address. It takes me from here to there. And my mom kind of understands that. That's the uh, two sentences and she's in on it. Delivering on that, it's much, much harder. And we're now uh, multiple decades into that uh, fantasy and we'll see if we ever really get there. This is equally similar, which is that it's very easy to describe to people that, ah, there's this uh, email agent where you can just ask it to set up a meeting with n number of constraints. And once you've done that, it will remove you from the threat and go out and do exactly what you asked it to do. Now, easy to say, much, much harder to execute on. So that's the, the backdrop. So if I jump in to the first learning and a lot of these are uh, mistakes. And if you ever kind of come back and try to kind of figure out who exactly to blame, you should blame me. So I was very much in love with the idea of us humanizing the agent and not just uh, coming from a CS background and uh, having watched uh, sci-fi for 30 years, but I thought if you crafted an agent that acted like and behaved very similar to that of a human, you would need to educate people even less and in some sort of utopia, fully kind of democratize access so that even those who don't know how to use a SaaS application would be able to use this because all they needed to do was be able to kind of craft a sentence, even in my uh, odd Danish English here, and they could take advantage. Now, when you pretend to be human, what I thought was exactly what I just described, it just didn't play out like that. What happens uh, was at least two things. And I could give you a long list of unintended consequences that comes attached to that of pretending to be human. 
surely uh, when you run around the office uh, in your t-shirt and look at the kind of incoming uh, requests and you kind of see that, oh, hey, we're running uh, 10,000 uh, kind of touring tests every day and we win most of them, that is kind of sexy. But if you really think about it, what do you win and what do you lose? What you win if people get fooled into believing that your agent is indeed human, you haven't won anything. They just had the task completed and aren't kind of you know, any, any better off. If you lose, you can lose a lot. As in somebody trying to put in a request to reschedule a meeting or try to explain why they're running late or try to do something very human-like for where they are trying to attach a level of empathy to the fact that they will be five minutes late or that they have to uh, ask to have it rescheduled for the second time, which of course, we have no, uh, no attachment to that level of empathy. They end up feeling duped. And that new emotion that comes attached to that of feeling duped into believing that this was a human and now finding out that it is not, is not a good one. That is one for where they go from wanting to help the system to almost wanting to sabotage it. So that's one. The other one is if you are not really tech savvy, and I'm not talking about people who come into the office and work a set of applications, go beyond that. Then people actually don't know how to speak to an open-ended agent. Kind of like uh, you giving your mom an Alexa for Christmas or a Google Assistant or something similar and ask her, no, anything which you want, just uh, ask this uh, device, give me three examples, mom. That is, uh, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a fun experiment. And her inability to do that turns out to be the inability for most people to know what to do, the single, or the single biggest item on incoming support tickets was, what can I say? Or what is the syntax? Uh, what is allowed? As in, they uh, didn't trust themselves to be able to uh, craft a sentence that the agent could understand, even though that we trained on, you know, literally tens of millions of email dialogues where we believe we've exhausted that kind of universe. But they, they couldn't imagine that. Just give me a list of uh, shortcuts or a syntax or ways to kind of ask the agent. That was uh, the one part. The other part, when open-ended, they were not able to imagine. But if I say this, what do you say to my guest? That, uh, and we can take a footnote here and I'll jump uh, to the next one, was uh, equally uh, kind of impossible for us to remove. As in, they continued to push on the idea on, I don't know what you're going to reach out to my guest with. And that's actually a very interesting kind of uh, product design uh, philosophy on who you're here to serve. So I thought and this is a little bit outside of, uh, of the five points here, but I actually thought, uh, like any good entrepreneur, that anybody who gives you money, uh, you certainly serve to, to a large degree, if, if not entirely. But just like, uh, and I think perhaps it was eBay early on, kind of came to conclude reasonably kind of quickly that given their two primary contingents, right? They got uh, buyers and they have sellers. They make 98% or more of all their revenue from their sellers. However, whenever there was a product design conflict or whenever there was a moment where you can kind of take a given path in two different directions, they ended up trying to serve the buyers. Why? To be honest, because the sellers don't give a shit as long as you give me a pool of happy buyers. Now, it was very similar in our universe. And I think it's gonna be very similar in any universe where you have an agent that will reach out and do work on your behalf and kind of do your work and do it in your good name. And what we found was they 
almost didn't care how we treated them. What they really cared about was how we treated their guests. And we started years back in flipping around most of our work to make sure that the delight across the platform was the highest on the guest end. And that's actually very funny that uh, today, I don't know, what is it, 0.6 uh, higher on guest versus host on a one to kind of five scale. So visibly, uh, guests being happier. Now, how can you solve that? I'll just give you kind of a quick example here uh, of uh, things that can kind of go, go wrong. So uh, first of all, when we say don't pretend to be human, we did it all the way down to uh, kind of the agent uh, having a first name, last name, a persona, a, a specific kind of style for how we crafted the messages, uh, even hired kind of theater majors to write out most of the dialogue and kind of help kind of craft the dialogue engine so that it was the same Amy or Andrew who kind of got back to people. We've since then uh, moved on and uh, it is very kind of software-like and called scheduler uh, today. But I want to kind of indicate uh, three parts here. There's the part for where you know, we went with a name, but there was all sorts of kind of product design choices and data science challenges that we had to accommodate for in this world for where we wanted to be humanized. First of all, even this one, as I'm sure you can see here, a very kind of human-like response from the guest and thanks much for organizing the call with Dennis, super productive, our kind of uh, managing partner would like to request access, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. This is not something that the agent can do. The agent can only do one thing, scheduling, which is a hard enough universe to kind of navigate. But now that we have these types of requests, we had to build up new models in our kind of product design for what, how do we know this is a request that is outside of the universe that we serve? And there's plenty of these and we built all sorts of predictions, including ones for say, uh, gratitude uh, for where somebody will come back and say, you know, thank you very much, have a great weekend, which is just the worst of responses because there's a temporal expressions. In that, have a great weekend, I now need to kind of confidently be able to confirm that I received a temporal expression and it's not a, an ask for a reschedule, for example. So just no, a complete nightmare once you kind of open this up and it doesn't really serve anybody. Here's another kind of interesting kind of uh, stat. So we've seen, um, we measure the kind of uh, success rate of request to actually event on calendar across our whole kind of population of, uh, of, of users. And we've seen it increase uh, multiple single percentage points when you moved just in a change of email as the only change, we've done a thousand other changes from Amy or Andrew to scheduler, because that immediately signals to people that this is a piece of software and you should treat it uh, as such. Now, the second one, and again, uh, certainly on me, I had a love affair with the conversational uh, UI. And certainly when we brought the team back together, it seemed like the next major UI paradigm would be the conversational UI. And I'm sadly old enough to kind of uh, remember how I took my CS degree on the command line, how my mom got introduced to the graphical user interface and how my kids grew up on the touch UI if we believe that's a distinct UI of its own. And it certainly looked like back in 2014, 2015, that the conversational UI would be another dominant UI in the not too distant future. That turned out to be not true. And it also turned out to be one for where many of the prior UI paradigms had a distinct workforce continue within that and stay put in it and not have a, a dramatic kind of overlap. The conversational UI 
turn out to be one that we all use, but somewhat sparsely and for a distinct set of uh, queries. And it didn't kind of propel forward to the degree for where you know, a large amount of our work today is done within the conversational UI. Now, it was also one of those where you were allowed to mix uh, UIs. So we um, certainly saw almost immediately that there was you know, tremendous value in the initial request and having that be done in natural language. So I could describe my constraints like uh, two hours, end of May, particular kind of title, you know, status of the individual kind of participants that this here was where we should try to excel on the NLP end, not so much on what went out to the guest. They actually had very little interest in conversing in right back to me the amount of times you're available or you know, have it back and forth on trying to converge on some Wednesday at 1.30. What they wanted was actually more of a traditional touch or graphical user interface for where, let me just pick one of the times available extracted from you know, Dennis's uh, calendar preferences and distinct, distinct kind of constraints attached to the requests here. And that was a kind of very interesting. We did a, a ton of tests trying to kind of figure out exactly what should this look like. And even as I'm sure you can imagine, the uh, dozens and dozens of kind of A-B tests on what should this look like. And we ended up on the software version being by far the better performer for where this doesn't look like something you should reply to. Uh, it looks like something you should pick a time or use one of the buttons here in the, in the email. And it was by far more successful. Now, third item here, if I just go back one, the natural language uh, understanding that is uh, the ability for whatever agent that you craft for where the input is natural language, uh, you should not uh, over index. And when I say over index, if I look at the capital that we've invested over the years, uh, I kid you not, uh, we've probably spent $20 million, something like that on labeling a distinct meeting scheduling data set of just short of 32 million distinct kind of uh, items over about four years, having about a hundred people do nothing but label that data set uh, full time. That is certainly a fantastic data set to sit with uh, today. I'm not so sure that we needed, if I could go back and play the whole thing out one more time to have done that as a first step. There was plenty of room for us and we call them kind of internally skill guarantees for where we tell people that for this part, there's a syntax, for this part, there's not a syntax. And they're actually quite willing to accept the fact that the agents that we craft in the year 2021 or year 2017, aren't uh, all knowing and they're very kind of positive if just told or well-educated or well-onboarded but we dramatically over-indexed on the natural language understanding and here's the crazy part uh, now I, you know this is laughable when I think about it think about it uh, going back we even uh, spent you know, you know time on allowing people to set their preferences in natural language uh, uh, which is crazy when I think back on it. Today though, we use traditional kind of uh, graphical UIs to kind of have you set up your particular meeting templates. Then you can take advantage of that bundle of, uh, of constraints, but don't ask people to write out a little novel or an essay to set their preferences. But that's kind of how dramatic we were in the beginning for where I want this to feel like, look like, and be like, a human assistant you just hired and you would tell Tom, your EA, that this is how I want you to run my life. Uh, not so in how people actually want it as a piece of software. Now, four, incorrect predictions are often 
fatal. This can be true, but if you take a step back, any kind of prediction you make or any kind of uh, space you're in, there's probably two types of predictions. You can either be in the kind of low accuracy and any prediction you make is of value bucket or high accuracy and any prediction you make might actually even uh, depend on a prior prediction. And if it's wrong, there is no value. Kind of like there's no meeting almost set up. Either the meeting got set up or it didn't. It's kind of a Boolean outcome. Uh, or either the car uh, didn't hit a pedestrian or it did. Now, there's plenty of uh, low accuracy predictions for uh, anything which you do is of value. Say uh, you upload a picture to Facebook, they can uh, find three faces out of five. That's a 60% accuracy, which is obviously very low, but it is of value. Uh, or perhaps Facebook is not the best example here. But anywho, uh, it was able to do three things that you don't have to do and you do the last two things yourself. Uh, that is a bucket you can exist in. There's plenty of product that exists in that bucket. Many though, for our particular company, we're in the high accuracy one. Not that that's uh, you know, better or worse, it's just a distinct uh, kind of bucket you can be in. And if you make an incorrect prediction, you are it is often fatal. What's even more uh, dramatic, uh, certainly for our kind of particular product design is I thought, footnote, there's actually some really interesting kind of papers out there if you are interested in this topic on the uh, level of forgiveness that you are willing to apply to a machine versus a human. And uh, for the very exact, uh, for, the, for, the, for a very kind of similar job, uh, what people found was that you are not willing to forgive the machine to the same uh, degree that you're willing to forgive a human if they did the job. They did this study on uh, stock trades. Now, for us, that was uh, crucial. And I just assumed if I did 19 fantastic meetings for you and I made a mistake, you would be willing to forgive me and I'll do another 19. That was not the case. Uh, people were really not willing to forgive. So we needed to be pretty much accurate every time. And if not that, it would be a near churn. That was uh, a, a rude awakening for us. Uh, one way to kind of solve for this, and if I were to kind of pick any of the thousand things we've done, this is probably the one that had the, the most kind of positive commercial impact. We started doing a read back so you asked me to do this, which you can turn on and off as you see fit, uh, but it's on by default. You asked me to do something. I'll just read it back to you. Hey, Dennis, please confirm the meeting details in order to proceed. Title, data science interview, step two. I probably said next week here, Monday, April 12th to 16th, Google Meet, who's in it, who's optional, duration, so on and so forth. This here, provided uh, certainly our particular audience a ton of comfort, as in, ah, oh, that means I can just ask the agent anything, however crazy, however incorrect grammar I might apply, it doesn't matter. I can even lie. And then upon getting this back, I'll just correct it. I'll say things like, let's meet up as soon as possible. I get this back, I'll update the details and push it out a little bit. Do all the kind of uh, tricks I'll do with a kind of human EA in that regard. That was uh, very interesting uh, to kind of see that something as simple as this kind of really changed the nature of the beast. Now, in closing, price agent as software. I, and, and this is kind of coming back full circle. Don't, don't pretend to be human. And if you're not pretending to be human, you're software and your software, you're priced as such. And by pricing, it as such, uh, because we priced it, uh, we've had three major kind of pricing tests. And when we ended up in the kind of software bucket, uh, it was much easier to see you know, forgiveness because you were willing to forgive software to, to some degree. And when the price matched it, I could kind of make at least apply some elasticity to that uh, forgiveness. And we started out at a uh, you know, kind of 
quadruple price uh, of this thinking that we are replacing some human work and that's the value which we can extract something from and we'll pick a price uh, that kind of matches that value. That was uh, not the right thing to do. And that was the uh, half decade short story on five particular learnings in the kind of intelligent agent space. And we'll be happy to kind of take some questions here or uh, you kind of calling uh, bullshit on my, uh, on my commentary. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I will admit this is an area that I know nothing about because I do not deal with intelligent agents. So um, if anyone out there has questions for Dennis or is doing something similar, trying to use AI in complementing their website, their mobile app, their digital analytics, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A area. And uh, so far we don't have questions posted, um, but uh, now's a good time to put them in. I don't know, if Dennis, if you have any other thoughts you could share while we're waiting to see if other if people put questions in. Okay, well, we have our first one. So how do you ensure that predictions for customers or users um, you do not have data or training set on? So any supervised ML endeavor, you will be longing for that particular inflection point for where the very data that you label is something that you escape and the very use of the product becomes the uh, label data. So for us, uh, given there's some sort of cold start problem here, there's no pre-existing uh, labeled uh, meeting scheduling data set we could get attached to. So we started out uh, hiring, I could talk long about how you kind of uh, attack that. But once uh, we got started, uh, we labeled the data set and that you're right, there's all sorts of kind of things here where it can end up being slightly uh, biased, say towards uh, you know certain years or what have you. I haven't seen the year 2021 much or 2022 much in my data sets. So all my data set is uh, 2016, 2017, 2018 and so on and so forth. So there's certainly things you can do here, but what we have started to do is that uh, in that readback, there's an update details. That means we now have a relationship between what you asked uh, and what you wanted. And that is actually a very good mechanism for us to understand the accuracy of our predictions and continue to kind of uh, learn from that. So that was uh, certainly, uh, one way. The other thing, which seems very silly, but ended up being a very strong signal, uh, at least for spot uh, checking and kind of uh, further development, we allow customers to rate parts of the dialogue one to five. And our data science team just spent an unfair amount of time looking at one star ratings to figure out what was it that you had hoped for here and what exactly kind of happened, playing out those, uh, those dialogues. Okay, well, next question. I really want to learn uh, to create and build an AI bot. What is the best way to learn? Can you recommend any resources to learn and create ML and chat bots? I would, uh, if I think back, the least difficult part of the journey was not building the model, whatever particular uh, technique or framework that you choose to attach to it, that is the easier part. I think the much more complex part uh, is you going to the whiteboard uh, and try to at least describe what particular universe do you exist in. So once uh, they decide to go do those self-driving cars, they obviously can't craft a conceptual model of the real world. So they come up with a simplistic version of uh, that universe that exists of, you know, road, signs, pedestrians, bicycles, and other kind of objects, but it's a very simplistic uh, kind of version. For me, I also exist in a universe, a meeting scheduling universe that I need to be able to describe. And it needs to be finite because if it's not finite, you can't navigate it. So for my uh, universe, there's a set of uh, finite set of intents, intents like uh, new meeting, council meeting, reschedule, running late, and so on and so forth, and a set of entities. For me, there's three distinct entities. 
there's uh, time, temporal expressions, locations, and people. And you need to be able to describe that and fully understand that. Once you've done that and you can write that document, you should then figure out what is the raw source of my data? Where does that arrive from? Once you have a good understanding of that, how do I label it? And what does my data labeling guidelines look like? That is the beginning of it. And anybody who can master that, you'll find the actual kind of uh, you know, machine learning models you put into production to be the easier part. And you actually win on the first part. That's certainly where I've seen most people win and or lose. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. So I think we'll just wrap a little bit early and I will get this recording into the SDEC Slack group. Uh, so Dennis, um, thank you so much. Oh, actually we had one last question. Uh, someone said, who who does, um, who, it looks like someone's looking to see who manages the taxonomy and semantics. Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. So we, had a distinct individual with expertise in labeling data. And Ling sat right next, uh, and with an army of labelers behind her, next to the data science team. And it was her role to put that in place. And just to kind of give you an idea of uh, some of the components here for our labelers, just to label time, like next Wednesday at one, uh, let's do uh, first week of May, I can't do that uh, Tuesday, so on and so forth. The temporal expressions, we had a 36 page guideline for how to best uh, label that, uh, or label it kind of accurately or according to our guidelines. So that is a, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, if anything, even before you hire your data, your data scientist, I would actually be hiring for this person first. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Um, oh wait, Eric keeps coming at us. Uh, yeah. What are your quantitative and qualitative success metrics? I think you can put them, uh, so I should almost just kind of share my uh, Datadog dashboards uh, here. I, I do think you need to perhaps put them into uh, two categories. There's all the usual uh, data science uh, metrics you put in place such as, such as precision or recall or what have you on one side. And we certainly look at those. I would try very hard to find really uh, solid product metrics because we many times spent months on end trying to improve a model with very little impact on product satisfaction. As in, I can now do some obscure uh, time range where you can say, let's do some afternoon, uh, April 19th to the 24th, uh, which is kind of uh, a, a double time range. And we'll work kind of, again, months on end to kind of support that particular kind of use case. But what does that, what, what kind of impact does that provide on the product end? So for us, it was uh, trying to come up with product proxies for where we looked at, and I'll give you just a couple here that, that work very well. We looked at, um, uh, what's the right word here? Thread length, that was the word I was looking for. So thread length, meaning how many back and forth was there in the dialogue, the shorter, the higher the satisfaction and the longer uh, positive relationship with the customer. So thread length was a very uh, good one for us. Uh, we looked at uh, kind of, you almost, almost always want to have some sort of success metrics. For us, it was a request to schedule a meeting, to event being on calendar rate. Uh, and we looked at that on different kind of request methodologies, whether it was requested on email or Slack, or it was a multi-participant or a one-on-one -on -one or only internal or a mix of internal and external. So we had all these kind of uh, segments we could look at to kind of see where uh, does kind of uh, that success rate kind of change. And uh, it is certainly much harder to set up a multi-participant with a mix of internal and external versus an internal one-on-one. -on -one. So we could figure out what to kind of work on, but they were certainly the ones we looked at the most were product related. Good, really good questions, Eric. Okay, 
Well, now I think you're done and let, I might just have Eric reach out to you. Uh, but um, cool. Thank you so much, Dennis. And this is definitely a, a, a little bit of a unique topic for our group, but something that um, is good for everyone to know. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dennis, um, he's out on LinkedIn and um, you, I'm sure he'll be able to answer them. So uh, Dennis, thanks so much for uh, sharing today. Thanks much for having me. Cheers, guys. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of the week.